head coach Danielle Henderson as our guest. A little background on the coach. Um, this, uh, this season was her sixth leading the program. Uh, an abbreviated season, the team went seven and nine in what was, unfortunately, as they say, a shortened season, but it was a season of just non-conference games. Oddly, or at least to my recollection, five of those 16 games went extra innings, and the team did rather well in those extra inning games. I will note, I think it was the second or third win of the year, was the win against Houston, the 7-4 victory, was Coach Henderson's 100th of her coaching career. Uh, UMass Lowell uh, won the America East regular season title uh, a year ago in 2019, going 15-3 and three in conference play. That came after a couple of second-place finishes. Um, Danielle is a two-time America East Coach of the Year. She is an Olympic gold medalist, part of the 2000 Summer Games that were played in uh, Sydney, Australia. She played and pitched as well in the National Pro Fast Pitch League. Uh, she coached at UMass, at Ohio State, and at Stanford. Uh, look back at her pitching career, and to me it was mind-blowing. Um, she went 108 and 35. That wasn't the mind-blowing part for me. 72 shutouts. Count them. 72 shutouts. That just was, to me, um, beyond something I can instantly recognize. Of course that happens. Uh, 14 no-hitters, three perfect games. Wow. Uh, that said, I want to turn things over to uh, Coach Henderson. And if you might, Coach, uh, kind of an overview of this uh, unfortunately abbreviated 2000 or uh, 2020 season. Thanks, Bob. Um... You know, this was uh, definitely a, a weird year to say the least. Um, I thought that from the very beginning in the fall, um, the team was right on, on track. Uh, I haven't seen a group kind of um, respond and learn so well. And, you know, it builds up to the season and all of those extra inning games, um, you know, they don't always – turn out in your favor you don't get that the win but um I thought that was going to be a great lesson for for the conference season and then especially the tournament so um kind of our goal for this year was all based around the the conference tournament because it's something that is is very different um for you know years especially in the transition the goal was to win the regular season championship because that is all uh, we were able to do. So then you, you're you able to enter the tournament um, and it's just a totally different ball game, different, you know, you don't know who you're going to face, whose team show up different. Um, like I know last year, uh, our, the pitcher Courtney Coppersmith just had a phenomenal tournament and she was hard to beat. So you look at how we were prepping, yeah, we could beat somebody in regular season, but how are you going to turn up in the tournament? So all of those lessons, uh, unfortunately, didn't get to be <laughs> – we didn't get to see the end results of that. But um, I thought that this was a very ma mature team. So that's what was disappointing to not be able to see how that was going to play out. Um, you know, this group was the first time we were able to play in the tournament um, – you know, the junior class were freshmen and, you know, that the senior class that we had were only sophomores. And as much as they're great players, I was looking back at video, they, they were up in some uh, pretty big moments, you know, and, and that's hard when you're so young and you have such a young team. So this year, um, we would, those same people are in big moments and you see them actually come through and, uh, the most exciting thing for me was going out in, um, in that Houston game that we won, you know, I'm going out to the field and it's basically juniors and seniors and they're telling me that they got everything under control and we're going to win this, you know, and as a coach, that's, that's what you want. Um, Cause there's plenty of times you go out there and the look in their eyes is, you know, more panic. But when they're telling me to basically get back, we got this, we're going to win. Um, you know, that gives me all the confidence and the energy that they had, the excitement for every little moment was just, was awesome. Um, and then to turn around and 
you know, be on the road and we're getting closer to the time of the year that we want. And, um, you know, we were in Tennessee. Uh, we were over by like Nashville area. And then we start hearing the news of what's going on. And the kids are like, they're not going to cancel, you know, our season. I'm like, no, that, that would never happen. And the more stuff is going, um, you know, our, our administration was staying in touch with us of what, what's going to happen. And, you know, we're driving from Nashville to Memphis and you start seeing on the news of March Madness canceled and this canceled. And it's like, uh Oh, like things started to get real. And we knew that we were going to have a delay and the girls were upset with that. Um, and then we get to the hotel within an hour later, you know, we find out the whole entire season is done. So it's like everything, I don't know, you thought everything was going well, and then you got to bring everybody in really fast. And it was, at up until this moment, it was probably one of the hardest things I had to do as a coach because um, you knew for some people their entire career is, is done. They're never going to play softball again. So as I brought them in the room, uh, you knew that they started to get some of the info because, um, you know, they, they're on Twitter <laughs> and, and they, they are in social media, so they know. So I could start seeing their tears. I couldn't, I couldn't stay in the room until everybody was there. And it was, it was hard to look at them and, and, and say that it got me, um, it got me choked up and, and crying to have to explain that to such a great group. And now here we are uh, <laughs> talking about how everything's going to be in the fall. And, you know, in that moment, it, see, it was, it was terrible for us. And now we look at what's going on in the world. So now our whole perspective of it is, is changed. You know, uh, everybody just wants to get back and get on the field again and be around each other again. You find it, and certainly that was an extremely difficult time for this team, and I suspect for teams in a variety of sports. Do you find that now with some time passing, it's easier to pick up the pieces and put things back together and take uh, the next step than you might have thought initially? Um, I do find that. Uh, so what we're doing now, so, you know, for us, you look at the season, so how a coach prepares. Um, we see what happened, how our season ends up. We're taking notes about everything we need to improve. I sit there watching, uh, you know, the World Series. I watch all the softball that's on TV, and you keep taking taking notes, and then you gear your season towards that. So, um, you know, now we kind of have to just – I think everybody's okay and just wants to play. So when we get back, um, we have to just kind of see where we're at and start from there. Um, and that's just different than it's, it's been. We've been trying to build. So we'll continue – all of that and you know we'll share that with, with everybody that we still want to do what we set out to do last year but it's just um just going to be different because I don't know where everybody's gonna be <laughs> I feel like everybody's starting at an evil even uh playing field because we haven't been able to to do stuff like go to the gym play softball so you know it's going to be how the group works hard together I think, Bob, I think, Bob, you're there. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I hear in your voice a lot of optimism about this year that unfortunately was never completed. And I'm curious, six years ago, you come here, in your mind, you probably had a plan of how we get to from point A to at some point down the road. Were we on schedule? Was this year kind of what you had planned? Was this fitting into your vision of how the program develops over a series of years? Uh, yeah, in many different ways, too. Um, you know, we had it scheduled. Um, and I, I don't know if it's just for the, the team keeps in, improving. Um, there were times we we played teams that were, you know, maybe out of our league. Like, you go to Auburn, it's you're getting the experience of that competition. Um, so we didn't do that this year. We played everybody who, you know, has a, a couple teams have a possibility to be in a top 25. Uh, and most everything I, I say is like 50, 50, you know, the, the game could be, could go to anybody. And, um, that was important because we just had to try to win every game, you know, not just play hard and play well and stay in it. I thought it's 
different to approach every game where you're trying to play your best and you want to win. So that's kind of how it was um, set up this year as opposed to, you know, when I first got the, the job, I didn't set up the schedule. We just show up and, and play in the tournaments. And, um, you know, and then it's just showing different competition because you don't have that tournament. You just want the team to experience and kind of improve and grow. And the past couple of years have just been, let's, uh, let's try to win. A couple of second place finishes, a first place finish. Haven't had necessarily the success uh, that we might have hoped for in the postseason tournament, though we have gotten to the America East Championship game. Is there, an, is there one more ingredient that needs to be added, or do you feel that all the pieces you need uh, for this team, for this program, are there? Um, I, feel that, I feel that all the pieces are there. I, I think the biggest um, part of a winning a tournament, you know, it's not a given. It doesn't matter what you did in your regular season. It's, it's really not a given. And all you have to do is um, set yourself up to be able to succeed. So even if we had the best team and we went unde undefeated, you could still lose in that tournament. Um, Cause it's, you know, the, the ball could bounce a certain way. Um, yeah, we could have a team hitting line drives right at somebody and another team we faced the ball could bloop in and, and you could win that way. So um, you just have to be able to prepare for that. And I thought that uh, this year, we were set up different because the team wanted to win it. It's hard to have a team want to win a conference tournament when they've never been there. You don't know what it is you're, you're playing and you're not going to work all year long to do it. So that's what I said before it was winning a regular season. So then, you know, the team could work hard. You come close, you come in second place, they're going to come back and work hard because they know what they're, what they have to do. And to only be in a tournament for two years, um, that, that was tough, especially when majority of the, the team are underclassmen. So you have that, a young team, the first time we're in it. But then we make it to the, the championship. And then the second year, um, you know, we're still pretty young, but then we don't fact, we know what we do, but we don't factor in what the other teams do. And um, I think it was this year when they kept showing clips of uh, the – championship game for the America East. I feel like the conference has gotten better every single year, you know, from five years ago when they showed it to last year's, um, you know, Stony Brook was a very good team and UMBC has a very good pitcher, you know, and so we look at that, but I know Binghamton had a very good young team and they went, they went far. Hartford keeps improving. Albany's always been, been good. And it's like you, you don't know what the other teams are doing. So we just have to prep our team and um, we just have to know that we're in there with a great shot to be able to win it. For, for UMass Lowell, and I suppose for teams in America East, is the only way to the NCAA tournament winning the America East tournament, or can we get in as an at-large, uh, as an at-large team? Um, it's not, it's softball is not set up for a team in the Northeast to be an at large. We have to win our, our tournament. Um, and so do a lot of the other schools in, in the Northeast. The at large bids um, go to like the strength of schedule. So you'll see the entire SEC is going to make it. Most of the Pac, <laughs> Pac 12 is going to make it. A lot of the teams from the Big 12. So all the Power Five teams are pretty much going to get the at-large and for mid-majors um, you're going to have to win your conference to get there. I will remind people that uh, you can use the chat function uh, to submit a question and uh, with that I will say John Kennedy says a uh, tough way uh, for the season to end coach. He says how are you doing your recruiting in these times? Um, well, since uh, the NCAA put a dead period, which means we can't go out, um, we have this thing called Athletes Go Live. So a lot of um, these past weekends I've spent on my computer having a couple different screens and you, they're streaming the games so we could watch the players that way. 
luckily for us, um, we have, you know, who's coming in next year, our 20 class, and we have our 21 class filled, so we don't have um, a, a need. So now we're looking at younger ones, which we, you know, we can't even talk to uh, until September 1 for the, the 22s. Um, so we're just keep an eye on, on that way. And uh, it's weird, but you can at least, it's, it's something. And, you know, I'd love to be able to sit out at a ball field at least close by, but now if uh, all the coaches you see, they have like three, four screens set up and they're watching as many games as they can. I assume, although now that we're really during the summer, I'm not sure how much contact you can have uh, with your team, but at least initially, was the regular contact when the season was ended and beyond that, when student athletes went home, were you able to, to keep in touch and what was kind of the approach during that period? Um, well, I think when we first went home, you know, there was a week because it, it was, um, it was hard for us coaches too to have it in like this and we're trying to figure out what's going on. And um, then we just set up like weekly Zoom meetings and it's just to kind of check in, um, see how everybody's doing. And then we started to get a little bit more creative and had like, a, like fun little chats with it and that as it, as it goes on. Um, but we can't make them do it right now because the school's over. So according to the rules, we can't force them and everything can be voluntary. But, you know, if we got to get something out, we have our little group chat. Um, I think that they keep in touch more where they don't need us on it. There was times that we had our Zoom meeting and once we log off, uh, there a group of them are on it for like an hour just talking. And I know they FaceTime each other. Um, but this would normally be a time where we're kind of leaving them alone besides maybe just a text message to check in and, and say hi. But yeah, for the past couple of weeks, there's been no Zooms. We, uh, our last one was, um, we had a, I thought that we had to end our season some way. So we kind of had a tribute to our seniors on the, the last one. So that was kind of our last mandatory Zoom because we, you know, we didn't get to honor them how we normally would. So uh, we, we did that. A question from Alicia Welch. Uh, we remember her. I think it's short stuff, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Um, says, <laughs> Are they doing a summer workout program? And how does that work if they may not be able to go to gyms? A lot of gyms, as we know, are closed. Yeah. Um, so our Connor had sent something out, and he sends them workouts. And uh, right now he's sending them stuff based on not being able to go to, go to a gym. It's, you know, different things. And early on, uh, I've been going on a lot of webinars for the NFCA. And, you know, there's just different things you can do, whether it's putting weight in a backpack or, you know, lifting up um, water jugs. It's just a lot of body weight stuff and probably more running, but they have something. It's not what they are used to. We're, um, we're a pretty strong team. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see uh, how they're able to, to come back. But, you know, our, our training in the fall is going to have to change because of this, because it's more body weight. It's not as much gym. You know, our testing is going to be now to see where they're, where they're at. Um, and we don't want them to get hurt. <laughs> so we're, we can't throw them into this and be like, you all have to, you know, lift all your weights and, and be just as strong. We kind of have to ease into it because they haven't been doing what they normally have. I will note that uh, Ms. Welsh also says that uh, she'll make sure that uh, Siteman is working out in New Orleans. That said, a question from uh, Lisa Tompkins. Uh -huh. um, she says, first off, thanks for doing this, Coach. And then she asks, uh, says, can you talk about the 2020 seniors and if they may be able to come back or not for the 2021 season? I will do. Well, first, I know Alicia will work Siteman out because Alicia worked very hard in that. So <laughs> I feel pretty good. And I know that Siteman's excited to be down there. So that, that should be uh, pretty fun. Um, so oh, the seniors that are coming back is um, Courtney Cashman, 
Christina Rizzi and Jenny Lee. So they will, you'll see them again on, on the field next year. Um, you know, Mary Ann, she got into PT school. So that's something that, that she has to, to do. Casey Harding has her, her dream job. And, um, you know, with, with engineering. And Melanie Sheldon is in Italy with her, her dream of, you know, being on the Italian national team. And, and Emily Stevenson, if she's going to be around, just, just finishing up. Um, but all these girls <laughs> prepared for their next phase of life. So a couple were able to. Uh, I'm kind of glad Cashman was because I know her next phase, she wanted to play basketball here. So <laughs> I'm glad she gets to play softball because I think if I saw her on the basketball court and not on our field, I might be crying every day. I don't blame you. She, as a person that takes pictures and is just an observer at games, she is an absolute uh, delight to watch, a terrific athlete. And having grown up in the Bronx as a Yankee fan in, in late 50s and 60s when it was all about home runs, I love watching Courtney Cashman hit the ball uh, out of the ballpark with regularity. I think eight home runs this year, and she's close to the career record. So I mean, let me ask, you recruited her. What caught your eye about her right off the bat? Um, she was an athlete, so it's, uh, it's f funny because she played on a team uh, called the Worcester Hawks, and um, Ralph Raymond was the head coach of the Worcester Hawks, and he was the um, – Olympic coach for 96 and 2000. So um, I got a phone call about her and said, there's this, he had called and said he has this player who, you know, is, is great and great athlete, all of that. And I, I believe, you know, Ralph Raymond is the winningest coach ever. And he's um, had some of the best softball players. So I, I take his word for that. And I go and I watch her and she just, she is this amazing athlete and, you know, um, I didn't know if we were going to get her right away because I think she just kind of wanted to weigh her options and, and see, and we got her at the, the, last, the last minute. Um, through the whole recruiting process, I mean, we are looking for, for athletes, especially um, trying to build a team. We, just, we want athletes that play different positions just because we didn't know how the, the team was going to fill you know we couldn't look for we need a left fielder we need we needed a middle infielder that could play wherever just so if you hit we could put you somewhere but yeah her athleticism caught the eye and Ralph Raymond uh caught my ear and, and kept telling me about her well you know you begin mentioning you like athletes and people who can play a variety of positions maybe I should ask when you go out recruiting do you look for a power hitter? Do you look for this or that? Or is it really about just finding, maybe with the exception of pinching, finding athletes figuring that they can play anywhere you need them on the field? Um, so there's, a, I mean, even catching, you know, we just need a catcher to be able to receive well and, and, and hit. Um, there, recently there have been times we're looking for somebody who's maybe going to be fast and can play the outfield. Like we've been able to look for more like position players um but early on we had to look for for those athletes and it kind of depends on the class too then we um we have a catcher a first baseman uh, an outfielder and a class maybe to fill that we're going to look for um a middle infield outfielder so somebody who we could maybe fill in in another position um but there has, has been years where like a whole class is just filled with those um, utility players that can go anywhere and some that are more position specific. Um, but, you know, to, to build it, you just, you have to get those really great athletes that are willing to, to work. And um, just the past couple of years, we've been out looking more um, at a specific skill set in a position. Maybe you've, you've already answered this, but I'm going, going to ask anyway because I'm going to ask it. Um, is there, if you were going to build the perfect UMass Lowell softball player, are the particular ingredients that absolutely positively have to be there? Yes, because, um, you know, this is, this is kind of a, a, a different type of school. 
I feel like you have to have those hardworking blue collar athletes, you know? Um, and so we look for those athletes kind of with a specific major and that are just, you know, or a, some people aren't okay with the, the area. They, they, they might've looked up, um, they, they don't like like the mill city and some people love it. So we've had great luck finding, um, engineers, nurses, like kids that are just willing to work. And, you know, I think that we have some of those great majors and we're also willing to work with them to, to do it. I know there's some schools that will not let you do nursing and play softball. Um, we, we have kids that sometimes um, they have to miss practice because of, you know, their, their major, but they're going to go out and get some, some great jobs. So I feel like the kids have to a, be really into a certain major and just kind of like be, um, I feel like we have a lot of happy kids on our team and fun kids too. So you just, I don't know, you, our group is, is, is different. And so sometimes when I go recruiting, there's some of them that never speak during the whole process and then I get to our school and they fit in perfect, kind of like the, the crazy bunch, you know, but they have to be hardworking in all areas. In, in talking about recruiting and, and what you look for, you mentioned they're a happy bunch. You mentioned earlier, I believe, you, you talk about the Zoom meetings that went on after the coaching staff left the Zoom meeting. It talks about a team that, that bonds together well. When you're recruiting, can, is it difficult to see character? Because I get the feeling when you talk about blue collar athletes, when you talk about a happy team, that character plays a key role in this. Is that something that you see when you're recruiting or is that something that maybe you get a little bit of a feel for, but you don't really ever know until um, they enroll here and then uh, begin living with their teammates? Oh, uh, you do get a little bit of a, a feel. Um, I must say a lot of, so, you know, when we bring them to like on an unofficial visit, um, just the whole dynamic and their, their parents, like that'll tell you a lot, you know, the, the kids that are, that come here, they leave and it's like, we, we love their entire family, you know? And I think that that, um, that's why the, the parents are the reason why the, the kids are the way they are. And, um, you know, they, they've just been, been raised different. I mean, there's people that we bring and you, you could tell that they're, this school isn't a fit and, you know, we're not a fit. Like we try to just, we try to be ourselves during the whole recruiting process and at camps and, I think when people come and they see a, a practice, um, then they, you know, it, it's the team that they kind of are drawn to and they, they like. I said I've, uh, I've had a style. I usually tell the team, hey, be on your best behavior because we have recruits and, and their parents come into practice and now that doesn't work. So now I have to warn the recruit and the parents saying I don't know what's going to come out of their mouth or how, the, how they're going to act. But they're going to have fun and I, somebody's going to be dancing and, you know, I, I apologize if they act a little crazy, but I promise that they work hard. <laughs> uh, this question from Michelle asks, uh, she says, what about your own playing career helped you or helped make you uh, the coach that you are today? Um, probably the fact that I'm, um, I'm from Long Island, New York. I didn't start pitching until, uh, I, so after ninth grade, I did this, what they called slingshot. So after that, I learned how to pitch windmill because they said, if, unless you want to um, go to college, you better learn how to play windmill. So I think it's um, just that I had to work really hard <laughs> to get to where I was. Kind of what you read off earlier did not just come. Like naturally, I didn't grow up with that. It it, it came through hard work. So, um, you know, to be able to get to college, I was only recruited by two two colleges. Uh, one was UMass, and the other was uh, Hofstra. And um, their head coach was a gym teacher at my high school. So 
he kind of knew all about how I have, how I grew and, and started. So um, I, I put all the work out for people to see, but so I got to college raw and I think just, you know, working and my, my coach being there and, and working with me every step of the way. And um, even through all the down stuff that happened, I would just know that if you kind of work hard, you could kind of set your goal. And I think also too, I was a little oblivious during the time because, you know, I, I don't, I didn't know, I didn't know bad stats. I didn't know any of that. I just knew where I wanted to, I just wanted to be good. And I just didn't want people to get on base. And if I could keep people off of the bases and from scoring runs, we had a shot at, at winning. So um, my thing was I worked to improve every single day from my freshman year to my senior year of college. And then that's just what I continued beyond. Michelle Assay, and you, you brought us talking about pitching. That really brings us right to her follow-up question. She says, do you have a different viewpoint as a successful pitcher? Um, yes. <laughs> and so, uh, and I think I learned this uh, early on. So when I coached at UMass, my head coach did everything. I just wrote the book while she called the pitches, and I learned from that. So... When I got to Ohio State, I got to call the game. And it took a while because my mindset was not uh, the pitcher's mindset that was out there. So I would think it was easy, like, come on, you just hit these spots. This is how you get them out. And um, I just had to learn that every pitcher is different and unique. And if I want them to succeed, they are not. I just had to get the idea that they're not going to think like me. Um, so once I can do that, I think it's a little easier to tap in to that. Um, and I think, I just think that it's a different position. And I think that the pitchers know that I've been through it. So I'm not asking them to do something that's impossible. And I don't try to make them do something exactly the way I did it. You know, and I think that that's a, that's a big part. Um, because I think that probably you could probably put a lot of pressure on them if you're expecting, you know, that same level. Um, because I, I did that to myself out of college. I expected myself to be like maybe Elisa Fernandez and Michelle Smith. And that puts a, you know, you're not anybody else but yourself. And once you could tap into your strengths um, physically and mentally, then you could succeed a little bit more as a pitcher. In baseball, they like to say that pitching is anywhere from 70 to 90 percent of the game. Earlier, you alluded to uh, Courtney Coppersmith and her impact as a pitcher uh, during the America East uh, softball tournament. I'm curious, in softball, in your mind, is it 70 to 90 percent? Might pitching even be 95 percent of the game? Um, it depends. Um... You know, it's let's just say you know when you have a really bad pitcher because they're you know the, the team feels helpless when a pitcher is walking like a lot of people giving up a lot of home runs that's going to hurt the the team. You could do okay if you at least have an average pitcher that will get you out because I know the defense wants to wants to work um, and you you know when you have a really good pitcher because they get a lot of strikeouts and they take away some of those, those outs um, with the U S team. Ralph used to tell us pitcher's job is to get at least 10 strikeouts a game. So you could at least take half the outs, you know, uh, you don't have to worry. So it's hard to get a dominant pitcher these days, um, especially because a lot of the big schools will get a lot of pitchers and so when we have Courtney Coppersmith who takes so many strikeouts, um, it, it can be tough to beat, you know? Um, and so I think that we, we were able to prep in regular season for that. But then when you get that person and you're, you have to face a, a Rarick and then a car, like you can't prep for one. She could really do that, that damage because then it seemed like she took it up a level. She took it up a notch come the end of the season. So um, 
Oops. Yeah, you you definitely realize a really good picture and a really bad picture. <laughs> it's the same as we say, uh, you don't realize how good a catcher is until you put a bad catcher back there and everybody is stealing and, you know, the umpire is getting hit. So you kind of, you almost want a pitcher to either go unnoticed or to be noticed like that. Okay, then and you say the big girls all get the pitching when then they've got more pitchers than they need. I suspect what we're looking for then is finding the next Danielle Henderson, at least based on your description, I gather you were really very much a work in progress uh, when you decided you weren't heavily recruited, two schools uh, were chasing after you when you chose to go to UMass. I guess your work in progress is, can, is it, obviously, I guess it is, but is it difficult to find somebody who's got that raw talent, but maybe they haven't had the coaching or the experience yet that can make them uh, a terrific finished product. And thus we have the opportunity to grab somebody like that and develop them. Um, so it's a different time because back when I started, people weren't getting private pitching lessons, you know? So now you have people that have the private um, instruction. And I think I, you know, when we were talking at our convention about early recruiting, before we had the new recruiting rules where you can't talk to them until September 1 of their junior year, people had um, seventh and eighth graders were being committed. And I was like, I didn't start pitching till I was 15 years old. So you got to set, you know, none of you would have even have seen, have seen me. So in that way, recruiting was, it's going to change now, but it was early. So you wouldn't see that. Um, but people are actually getting more instruction and playing more games. I feel like our, the game of softball has gotten better. Um, but with that, I feel like, just like all of our, our players, um, we get pitchers that are going to continue to get better every single year. It's just kind of that, that mindset and that, that work ethic that they, they have. Um, I think, we, I mean, he was well, Tal last year threw a perfect game, you know. Uh, Lavina was on to have a, a great year. We had, like – we, we have had very good pitchers and it just comes down to that mindset. And each year they're trying to, you know, improve one area of their game. They don't come in trying to improve everything. We go with what they got and then just maybe trying to, to add a little something. You described yourself earlier as a hard worker. And as you say, you didn't begin pitching uh, until a little bit later than typically is the case, but that still got you to the Olympic team and got you to Sydney, Australia and, uh, eventually a gold medal as well. What was the Olympic experience like? Um, all of the hype you see on TV is real. <laughs> it's how I say, you know, you see these things and you're like, oh, it doesn't live up to all of that. It does plus, plus more of that. Um, you know, the whole entire, like to Sydney, the whole area was just all based around the Olympics and you have people from all over the world there. You're in um, an Olympic village that is very heavily like security and, and guarded um, that you need everything. You have to go through it like a, like you're going through an airport to get into your place and um, there's food, everything you need. And just, I remember walking in uh, to the opening ceremonies where there's like a, you're walking into a stadium of a hundred thousand people like cheering for you as you walk through. And it's just, you know, a very neat experience. And even at the game and like winning the gold medal and you're on the podium and they're playing the national anthem. Um, you just, I remember just sitting there going, holy cow, like it's just unbelievable. And you, nothing, nothing will ever describe it or ever feel like that. Is it, I don't know if, if players ask you about it. Um, I don't know if that affects them, but I've, it certainly affects me. Um, but does that, is that something that players ask you about at all? Uh, I feel like they tease me more about it, to be honest. <laughs> so if they don't really ask. I, they they kind of just um, mock me and, and tease me more. <laughs> 
Uh, earlier, we had a question and some comments from Alicia Welsh. It, it reminds me or uh, provokes me to ask, do you find that uh, the alumni, do they stay in touch? Are they supportive? And are alumni important in helping this uh, program grow? Well, um, it's, it's funny and I laugh. I, I didn't realize it um, until I blew this picture up. We have the picture of us uh, winning the regular season championship and taking a picture on the field. And I have it blown up as a poster size in my office and I look and <laughs> there's like all of like Alicia's class, like in the background up top there. And, you know, we see Tori Alcorn making a face and like she normally does being silly. I'm like, this is totally fitting that they're all trying to get in this picture and I wouldn't have known it unless it was like a poster size. So, um, you know, they, they were, they were awesome, like through all of this. Um, Cause I think that all the, the girls are, are close and they come back and they support e each other. So um, I remember trying to win that regular season championship when we came in second that for that first time, you know, that class that graduated, they were all, they all came to Albany to like cheer the team on. And um, I think that's important to the, to the players, but they were a lot of, they were big. The ones that had graduated and came back and, and supported were a big part of why the team was where they, where they were at. You know, they were a group that um, basically could never play in a conference tournament. <laughs> is the transition happened while they were there. So for them to actually be able to put in the work that they did and be able to pass some of this stuff on to the next class and, you know, to work, work hard and come in second place, <laughs> you know, to be like from second to last to second place in your four years, it, it says a lot. Um, so, and now we, we keep trying to grab a, uh, all the older alums back too, because I think that, that that's important to have. Um, that from where I graduated, that's what we, we had. We had big alumni support and I, I know what that means to a program. So that's something that we just keep trying to expand and trying to come up with ways to try to build. You mentioned uh, learning as a coach. Um, when you went to Ohio State and were in the position of calling pitches, so on and so forth. I'm curious, as you look at it, six years here at UMass Lowell, do you feel like a very different coach now than you were in year one? Or is it more you're, you're the same coach and there have been just a few tweaks? Oh, I feel, I feel like a totally different person. Um, you know, I, I always believe in you. You just have to be positive and believe in yourself. And you, you could win any game. And... Um, you know, I learned it was a little much harder than, than that. And I think of, I've been a student of the game and I've worked, but there was parts of the game that I didn't know. I remember like some of the first practices where you're running a cut and a relay. I know where everybody should be, but now everybody's asking me those questions. <laughs> it's like, I would have to take the time to be like, okay, during this time, I'm usually running and backing up. I don't know where this person went to. So I would have to, when I would go recruiting, um, ask a lot of questions of other coaches out there that I know and just try to learn the game and more of like the X's and O's and the setup that way, not just a pitcher versus hitter, feel the ground ball, <laughs> make, a, make a throw. So I feel like I'm different in, in that way. Um, and then just, I don't know, just learning the game a lot more and a lot different um, and just how you communicate with the team and, and set it up that way. You mentioned um, asking other people this and talking with coaches. As you look at yourself as a coach, do you see a lot of the different coaches that you played for or coached with in yourself now? Um, I will see um, – different experience that I, experiences that I went through with those coaches and maybe lessons that they've, they've taught me. Um, not necessarily the, the personality, you know, or how they say it, just maybe I, 
you know, ran through something at practice and how they taught us to get through something. Um, I've had a lot of different from, you know, college to national team to two different other colleges. And uh, even in the pro team, we've just, you go through different experiences. So I wouldn't say I handle it um, like anybody else that I know, because I've been, I've always kind of been very calm like this. Um, even when I first started coaching, my, my coach was very high strung. Uh, high energy and couldn't sit still and I would be there when things get a little crazy I will try to quiet and calm down and she would look at me and tell me I had no pulse like <laughs> you know and I, I would get yelled at from her for how I reacted as a coach but I'm I'm a pitcher too so you have to show no emotion and I think that that's also something that you know I like to take with me <laughs> you can't you have to have that poker face on a lot I guess uh, we're nearing the end of this uh, time period here. I guess the last thing I'll ask, I'll ask you simply, as you look to the future, what is the, the one thing you're most anxious to get to, whether it's uh, fall ball or next uh, spring or what? Just on your calendar looking forward, what's the one thing you're most excited about? Just getting the whole team together again. That, that's what I'm looking forward to. And um competing through a regular season like a whole entire season you know like i said this happened to our spring sports and i don't know that anybody could say with 100 percent certainty that everything is going to be okay in the fall in the winter we we hope we're going to follow everything you know accordingly so that that could that could happen um but i just i want to be with the team again and to be able to compete and do everything like we always do and I know this year it'll be different but I just I want to have a whole entire season and a whole entire year is all I'm looking forward to. Yeah we'll hope that all of those things come true and and coach I thank you very much for your time to those that submitted questions we thank you very much for doing so um, this conversation with the coach and I say this is the eighth time we've done this I suspect there will be more and um, I will turn things over to John Boswell and he'll tell you um, what we should look forward to, if anything, at this point. I don't know if things are on the schedule or things are simply um, being discussed. But uh, again, thank you very much to Coach Danielle Henderson. And John, it's your ball game now. Thank you, Bob. Um, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Coach. And really, thank you, everybody, for participating today. Um, it's great to see everybody virtually and, and connect with our Riverhawk family. Uh, we really appreciate your support and uh, continued support of the Riverhawk softball program. Uh, Coach, we thank you very much. We do have this recorded, so we'll shoot out a link to everybody who participated, and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody, for signing on.